Uh, greetings from Alaska, everyone. This is Fred Roll, uh, Curry Island Tribal Council member from Dillingham. Um, uh, what I'm going to share with you today is uh, something that Don has been sharing with me over the course of about three or four phone calls. Uh, he was very emotional about it, understandably so, and, and you'll hear why. Um, Don lives in Aurora, Illinois now. He was a lifelong Alaskan resident until this situation happened. Um, so it, he, he worked on the pipeline years ago, and he liked it so much, he stayed, and uh, which a lot of people do. It's beautiful and understandable. Well, Don had it to where um, he was squirreling away money. He was a single guy, and uh, he, he got him a nice little nest egg because he wanted to buy some property and, and do a little homestead-type deal. Not homesteading like they have the channels for now, but legit, you know, Chichaco-style homesteading. So he does his thing, and... Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Just that a little bit. So, he does this thing. He works. He, he ends up getting married, and he puts off his dream for about five, six years until that didn't work out. She didn't like Alaska. He did. Blah, blah. You know. So, he finally finds a, a piece of property he really likes. And this particular piece of property is, uh, we'll say north of Trapper Creek. Okay. Uh, I won't give specifics because he just he just sold the place. Um, any, anyway, that's that's their business. I, he, he made the owner, uh, the new buyer, aware of exactly what I'm going to share right now, and they, they didn't care. So anyway, so he gets his piece of property, and he builds himself a little elevated cabin, skirted it up, just a single shell uh, cabin, single room, and uh, he, he had lived there a decade. Uh, no problems, no no issues whatsoever, not even a bear coming through his yard. Uh, nothing, you know, he would hear wolves off in the distance sometimes, so he would, you know, have a rifle stationed if he had heard them the night before. But he never had an issue, ever. And and he by this point, he, he got up in here in the 70s, and this just, this incident occurred uh, two or three years ago. So... He's building this place up. He's got, you know, a couple little outbuildings, and he's got himself his own little garden. So he's he's really digging it. And about three years into this, he, he decides he's going to invest in a good quality dog. So he buys himself a Cinnamon Doberman Pinscher. He named the Cinnamon Doberman Pinscher Rebel. Okay. Uh, Rebel was a great dog. He had all the time in the world. Quasi-retired, you know, had a nest egg. He was just living his own dream. So he had time to train the dog daily. So, uh, moving forward, great relationship. The dog goes everywhere with Don, right? And, and rightfully so. You know, it's it's his bush dog. Anyway, seven years into the dog's life, uh, this uh, a week before he decided to sell this property, this is what went down. One night, he was sitting there. It was uh, early fall, and the sun had just gone down quasi on the horizon so now rebel was sitting by his feet and he squatted down he was doing something with some kindling for wood pile or something like that and rebel takes off runs down a, a trail they go down every day well what don would do is have different fetch toys for the dog so he would uh as they're walking he would just randomly throw a ball or a stick or whatever it is off into the tundra or you know off into the trees for the dog to just have something to do while he was doing his thing. So the dog taking off, he figured, oh, he's going to get his chewy and he'll be right back. You know, no harm, no foul. It, it's nothing uncommon for this dog to do that. So he does it. But just a moment later, after the dog disappeared into the quasi darkness of the shrubs and stuff and, and down the trail, he heard it. He heard this yelp. Real, real like, oh, yeah. he thought maybe the dog got into a porcupine. It had happened a couple years before, so he was like, oh, crap, Rebel, you should know better than damn porcupine. So he was anticipating dog coming back with quills and the muzzle and that type of thing. Well, dog comes back, but it, he's gimped up on the front on the front paw. Uh, something, it, it, somehow he had twisted his paw. So as he's looking at his dog, the dog is trying to get inside. The dog wants nothing to do with outside. And he's obviously hurt, but didn't give a shit and was trying to get get the hell out of Dodge. And he was trying to make sense of it because none of it made sense. Well, as he's doing that, at the tree line, about approximately not even 30 feet away, he hears the scream. He said this scream 
hurt his ears. He 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 literally had to cover his ears. It was so so loud. And uh, as soon as that scream ended, he watched a dark figure he couldn't fully make out grab the small birch tree, which was uh, you know about three inches in diameter or so roughly, and just snap it off and rip it off. And it tried to throw the upper portion at him. Right. This thing still had leaves on it or whatever, but it, he was already, uh, once the scream hit and the scream stopped, he had picked up rubble and was heading inside when this thing chucked the top of the tree. Now, it wasn't some huge piece of a tree. It was simply just the top. It was probably about 10 foot long with a bunch of branches and so whatever leaves were left on it. He gets inside and he shuts and locks the door and, and he's sitting on his knees. He, he's literally in shock. Um... He, he was crying when he was telling me that he had never been so fearful. Uh, he literally sat on his knees holding his dog, trying to trying to help his dog's paw because it was twisted around. Um, he wasn't sure if it was just dislocated or what. So he was, he was trying to hold it together and, and help his dog. And while he's doing that and sobbing because he, he just can't, it, it, nothing was making sense. And I get it because it, it's so when something like that happens it's i can't even express the the level of uh, just what the fuck you know what what the fuck so anyway sorry he he's sobbing and contemplating what you know what the hell's going on then he hears this tapping on the window and and, and he's just kind of quasi you know uh not fully there cuz he's kind of basically in shock so he looks up and looking at him in the eye, uh, taking up half, uh, it, he can't, He said it came up to just above halfway in his window and he's got four foot windows, two foot off the floor. So we're looking at, you know, approximately uh, four, four or five foot of this thing visible in the window, but the floor itself stood at least four feet off the ground. So it was on some pilings and it was skirted off underneath this cabin. So this thing was nine, ten feet tall, roughly, give or take. So, and, and he's just stuck staring at this thing. He said it had uh, kind of like a milky gray. Um, it, it looked kind of blotchy, like uh, it had a skin condition or something. And uh, flat, broad nose, uh, similar to a Native American. Um, but he said that the, the hair kind of had a widow's, little bit of a widow's peak wrapped around and then came back down under the nose like that. And it was real sparsely around here. And it was like, uh, almost reminded him of mutton chops, but it came down to a beard. It, it, he said it was just, it, it didn't, he couldn't figure out what the hell he was looking at. And so he's sitting there in shock. Um. This thing's tapping, and then it starts circling around the cabin and starts banging against the wall. And, and and he hasn't moved. He he has a weapon there, but he forgot about that gun. He told me he, he couldn't even wrap his mind around what was happening, let alone his, his digital camera, his digital camcorder, uh, his gun. None of that. None of it even popped into his head. He was too traumatized in the moment. So as he's trying to emotionally cope with what's going on outside he's got the dog on the inside just going just going ape shit now this dog's hobbling around with a potentially broken paw going crazy like snarling slobbering just following this thing as it moved around the outside of the cabin picture it rebels just barking at the wall he sensed where it was and just kind of walked around well this thing circled around once or twice okay he was in trauma so he don't remember exactly how many times it had circled but that came up to the door and he said uh this place only had three windows one on each side one in the back next to his bed and the door had a small square window in it right a steel door of course and so uh part one of the things he had built into his cabin was this little lean-to board that leans down underneath the the handle of the door so in case a bear was trying to get in, it had support right at the doorknob. So midway on the door, it had reinforcement. So there was no way to get play moving to easily pop it. So immediately he turns around and, and he uh, puts that into place. It was just, it was uh, on a hinge. All he had to do was just stand it up and it fell right against the door. And if the door tried to open, it would catch on the knob and, and 
keep it shut. Pretty ingenious, actually. So <laughs> he flings it up, and he can't make anything out. And he tried looking out the window, the, the little square window in the door, but it was pitch black, so he was like, well, it's dark out. I'm not going to see anything. So he turns around and grabs a flashlight, comes back over to look out the door because he's still hearing noise. And when he turns on the flashlight, he catches a single eye, eye shine looking at him through the window. Oh. <sighs> he said it was a blaze orange red. It blinked and then the, the it moved away. Oh, shit, fuck that, man. Anyway, so, and me and Rebels just doing his thing. So he said it was chaos, trauma, terror, and what the fuck, you know? Um, excuse my language it, it, it's just what it is things calmed down it, it appears at that moment this thing was gone he had peeked out the windows nothing he got the drapes quasi shut not really because um, he's he, you know he scrambled to do it so at this point he, he bandages rubble kind of splints it the best he can and, and he's emotionally drained and wiped out so he goes lays on his bed crashes out he wakes up to rebel licking his face and as he's coming to and snapping out of it and realizing oh what happened last night kind of thing uh he along with the licking he's feeling this weird tapping dunk 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 and it feels like it's coming from the floor like and he was like well the whole place is skirted and he's like did this thing get under my under my cabin it, which I would, you know, be worried about that shit too. Like, what the... F but what was going on is this thing was just on the opposite side of the wall from his bed. And where it was hitting the wall, it was hitting his bed frame. And it felt like it was originating from the floor. But it was actually originating right next to him. And he didn't realize it because he was coming out of the fog. Oh, God, what a way to wake up. He sits up. He's listening to this tapping. And he's trying to make out, okay... And at this point, he's contemplating shooting through the damn wall. And I don't blame him. I, I would have already been shooting. Anyway, uh, no judgment, Don. I, I, I understand that shock. It's very just good God, man. Good God. So he sits up and he's coming to and he's trying to figure out what's going on. This tapping's continuing. And out of the corner of his eye, on the window that's uh, on the same side of his bed, he's got the one window next to him, a window about eight feet away on his left hand side and then the other one mirrors it on the opposite side on that side and then the little square window in the door well just at the edge he, he could see out that window to his left just you know about that much of it because that at the angle he was he only had about this much view at that angle out that window but he noticed movement so he looks over he kind of leans forward to get a better look and it's one of these things looking at him just just looking right at him. Wouldn't take its eyes off him. Just kind of kept, you know, just kind of doing the slow motion thing. Good God. So, as that's happening, it dawns on him the tapping is still going. So that one that he's looking at isn't doing the tapping. There's a second one. And and, and he, at, at that moment, he was like, what the, f you know, screw this noise. He goes for his gun. And, it, you know, at that moment, it was fight or flight, and he had nowhere to run, so he was going to fight. He wasn't going to have none of it. He, he it, it, you know, it just clicked within him. He's going to he's gonna put up his, his fight. He thought they were there to get him. Um, and, and who knows? It's speculation. It's, uh, let me finish. So, grabs the gun. As soon as the one by the window sees that gun, all of a sudden, it, they're gone. Poof. They, they just bail out of there, right? So he's like, okay, they, they know what a gun is. Good, because this is all I'm going to have for him from now on is, is a gun. They hurt my dog. They're terrorizing me. I'm over it. Day, the morning continues. Nothing happens. It's, it's just dead quiet outside. He doesn't want to go outside. He just basically holds up in his cabin, keeping a lookout every once in a while. He cooks for him, get, feeds his dog. And it's getting on into getting later in the day, and he it dawns on him Rebel hasn't been out once yet. So he wants he wants Rebel to you know go use the facilities so to speak you know go pee on a tree or whatever real quick before it gets dark. Because um, with what's going on, and they had already hurt his dog once, he didn't want them you know he didn't want to risk it. And it, understandable, you know 100 percent. 
And uh, hold on one second here. Sorry about that. So, okay, it's recording. So he lets Rebel out. Um, Rebel just goes to the bottom of the stairs, lifts the leg, does his thing, comes right back inside. No sooner than he gets the door shut and he's shutting this little thing, he feels pressure push against the door. And there's that thing in, in the little square window. So he puts his little makeshift door brace up. And this thing's just, because the window was so small and its head was so big, it would just had the one eye looking in at him. Fuck. And immediately, he runs over, grabs a rifle, and when he turns around, there's nothing in the window, right? He, he, at, at this point, it, it's it's to the point where he put it in his mind, the next time I see one of these freaking things, I'm just going to start shooting. I'm not going to guess. That there's something going on, and they're trying to do something and he could he couldn't put it together because he was still in a a fog of trauma you know uh one of these things screaming at you the next thing they're they're tapping on the place and looking in the windows it's not it's not where you would want to be that's for sure so he's he's two of the windows never had a curtain one did the one next to his bed but he's trying to get old blankets and stuff and make these makeshift curtains to block their view in because at this point, after it left the door, he was seeing movement outside the windows. And it was silhouettes. It was still light out kind of in the, in the sky, but he couldn't make out any features of who and what was moving around, right? But he knew he didn't want them to be able to look in at him. So he's doing his thing, and as he's going to the the one window to hang up an afghan which everyone knows it has a bunch of holes in it but it, peace of mind it's some some kind of visual barrier he's hanging it up and he's banging some some nails into the wall real quick to hang the afghan on because he had no no hooks for curtains and as he's doing this at every tap he did directly behind him on the wall uh, a mimicking tap so bump 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 and and he just kept doing what he was doing. He he was over. He wasn't gonna react to anything. He had you know made up his mind. It, it's time to something's got to give. Something's got to give. Cause where he's at, his truck to get the hell out of Dodge is almost a quarter of a mile back to where the road ended and and his property began. And he had no driveway cut into his place. It, it, logistically, it would take a butt ton of gravel to get a good base layer to even make anything worthwhile. So he, that's just how it's worked for him for 10 years at this point. Now, as he's mentally thinking about his truck and getting this Afghan hung and all that, he he, he decides he's gonna ignore it um, because he was really, he felt like, he felt like he was gonna have an aneurysm or heart attack. He, he felt his blood pressure way too high and, and he, he's not a spring chicken. Uh, he's in his mid sixties when this occurred, and and he just knew it was taking a toll on him and his body, and especially his heart, because he could feel like palpitations or something happening, or anxiety, a panic attack, whatever you want to call it, and and rightfully so. Uh, I mean, he he wasn't under siege; they weren't actively trying to break in, but they had him freaking surrounded, you know. And and he's clueless; he has no idea what to do about it. He starts cooking something to eat. He's going to do something normal to break his mindset. Let me focus on making some Spam and eggs, you know. So he's frying up his Spam and eggs. And just as he was cracking the eggs to put into the pan, boom, something hit really hard behind his little cooking stove, little counter area. And it hit so hard, his little Coleman stove slid forward. He had to catch it, kind of burned his hand a little bit, slid it back. You mother. So he went, runs and grabs a rifle. And he shoots through the wall right where it happened to have banged against it the last time, hoping it was still standing there. And uh, it, it was just OSB rough sawn on the outside, and you know, typical drywall on the inside, two by six kind of kind of framework or whatever, basically like a house wall. But we call them cabins because it's in the woods. I, I don't know. Me, a cabin's a log cabin. So anyway, but his cabin. So he shoots through the wall. He shoots once. And there's not a sound. He shoots a second time between where he first shot and where that window is. Boom! Here's a scream. But the scream came from the opposite side of the cabin. And and it was just like... he You know, there was no... Nothing 
you know, tangible is why he shot out this one and it screams over here, unless that one was startled by the shot. And he was speculating. So nothing happens. It goes dead quiet. And after uh, he finished tending to his dinner, shaking, he, he, he was so upset he couldn't even eat, but he was hungry. So he was, you, you ever been so stressed and you're just forcing food down? It tastes like shit, even though normally you like it. You know, he was so stressed, he was he knew he had to get something on his stomach because he could feel the bile just, oh, jeez. Oh. Anyway, I feel for you, Don. So, he, you know, he's dealing with that. Now, he just shot a couple times. Uh. His he said his ears were ringing from the shots, and I had asked him. I was like, "Well, did you feel feel any weird pressure or anything like that?" He goes, "No, no, not not that night." And you know, I didn't I didn't feel that. He does later though. So the night goes on. Periodically, there'd be a thump, a bang, dog growl. Dog would run. You know, I'll periodically jump off the bed, run over, grrr, growl by the door, run back over by a window, growl by the window. So the dog is basically kind of running around, and he's kind of gauging okay he's actively barking over here immediately running here then back over here so uh, he he's counting in his mind at least three of these things right and he for the life of him he can't figure out why after a decade this is happening here never once had a bear come to his yard heard wolves in the distance the most he ever had come to his yard was a porcupine a few years earlier when rebel got clothes in his mouth that that's the extent of the wildlife um, there was more wildlife a little further down, but in his particular area, he was pretty pretty close to a muskeg, and, and so there wasn't a whole lot of activity outside of, you know, the errant porcupine, maybe probably some marten in the woods that he was unaware of, but so he's sitting there, and he's trying to his best to ignore everything going on, but remember, rebels periodically run around doing this, so it's really hard for him to forget about it, because it's in his face, he can't avoid it. Goes like that all night. He finally falls asleep just as he could see light on the horizon and, and and he sleeps and he's woken up approximately midday rebel looking him again gets up immediately he's looking out the windows there's no tapping it's dead quiet outside he looks all around nothing he uh in the small closet he had he had a 45 70 lever action the rifle he had that he shot through the wall with was a 243 good for caribou you know it's not a very very potent gun it'll it's still a gun but um so he gets the 4570 out and he gets out his old uh, big bore loads and you know he loads it up and chambers around has rebel stay inside he goes out and he circles around a couple times and he notices these depressions in the ground where these things have been walking and he noticed back by his bedroom side something had been pacing or just right outside the other side of the wall and it, it, the realization of I wasn't seeing things there's physical evidence in these tracks and they were something was pacing anticipating something from me is what he gauged so he goes back inside and things are calm at, at least for the moment things are calm he lets Rebel out to do his business. Rebel's doing his business. And it, it hobbling around, but more perky, not as, uh, uh, you know, like uptight. <sighs> out of nowhere, way off in the distance, he hears the what he claimed to be the identical scream just before it had broke the tree and threw it at him. So he hears the scream way off in the distance. And was like, okay, it, excuse me. That thing has to be at least five miles away. You know, it's got to be way far away. He calms down a little more. They're moving away. Okay, maybe this is this is done with. So he, he's going about his way. And he went to retrieve uh, some kindling, some firewood stuff, and whatever he was doing. Um, just, just household chores. He's got to stay warm, and he's got to replenish his stockpile inside the house. Because his pile's right outside on the side of the cabin. So as he was collecting the firewood, some of it was moved, but nothing too malicious to his property outside um, as far as him tearing anything up or breaking it, right? So he gathers up this wood, and he goes in, he drops a load, looks around off the porch or whatever, goes back down, grabs another armful, so he has two, three days worth of firewood to get through the nights, you know, and God forbid something else happens. And so he goes back up, gets the wood in, and then he's standing on the porch whistling for Rebel. 
not hearing from Rebel. Rebel's nowhere to be seen. Now, he, he's immediately, his heart drops because he loves that dog. He's had it seven years now. And so he goes, you know, he, he grabs his rifle from the porch where he had it staged in case he needed it. And he grabbed a headlamp and a flashlight. He wasn't sure. It wasn't dark. It, this was still daytime. He had time before the sunset, but he wanted to be prepared in case trying to find Rebel took him further away from the cabin and it started to get dark. He wanted to be able to see to end one of these things because at this point he was over it. It was time to, to shoot something. <clears throat> so he goes down their favorite trail. He goes down and he thought he saw Rebel's collar. Now, it wasn't a collar with the rabies tag and all that. It was a bright neon green with black checkering collar, a, a big thick one. And he did that because it happened to reflect at night. So if he was calling for Rebel and couldn't see him, he could beam a flashlight and see where it's reflecting and see what he's digging in and getting to, you know, at night or whatever. So he, he you know, he's anticipating this. He follows his trail, finds the collar, and, and he knows something is bad. Now, off in the distance a little ways, he hears a yelp, a real short roar. Immediately he starts heading that direction. He's pissed. These things have his dog, and he's 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 gonna go kill something. You know that's I mean that's that's where his mind was. He, he was off. He was off to put some rounds on some things. But before he goes trupsing on down the trail, he goes back to the cabin real quick and grabs more ammo, and he fills his two front uh, flannel pockets with ammo in his pocket. So he's fully loaded with extra ammo. He, he, he was ready for war. He was, he was so done with it. Uh, I grabbed his 44 Magnum revolver, strapped that on as well. He was going to get his dog. And uh, he said in 2020 hindsight, he felt he was being watched while he did this because as soon as he got off the porch and started going the direction of the Yelp, he heard a Yelp again, but coming from a different direction. So off in the distance, this thing went from his left to his right and is approximately somewhere in the woods behind his cabin to the back side from his front door. So immediately that changes the way he's walking in the woods. There happened He had multiple trails, so he took the trail closest to what he thought. Uh, he figured they tried to get him and Rebel was hurt and making trying to make his way away from them and make it back to him, right? So that's what Don was thinking. That, I mean, you know, he didn't know for sure, but he, that's what he was hoping for. The dog wasn't in any, uh, maybe hurt, but still able to, to make it back to him. Goes down the trail not seeing nothing not seeing nothing and he's starting he's starting to tear because he feels something wrong within him and he's like it dawned on him he goes what if these things are lure using rebel and my love for him to lure me out there and and that's quite possibly what was happening because so, he was like okay he stops and he goes in that moment he goes i had to let rebel go if i didn't if i didn't mentally just let rebel go my emotions were going to take over and I was going to run off in, into the woods and probably never be seen from again. That's the feeling he had in the woods at that moment. So he stops and he, he was about 100 yards from the backside of his cabin at this point along this trail going for this Yelp sound. So he, he, he just decides, I'm done. I, I'll take a stand at the cabin. Uh, maybe I'll just go back now, gather up some stuff and just drive out of here. He he had a whole lot going on because he was, he was, in essence, losing his life, his property, his dog, everything that he cherished is at jeopardy right at this moment, and, and he's really struggling. So as he's about closed half the distance going back, he hears his dog Rebel yelp again a lot freaking closer within 50 feet behind him off the trail. So immediately he's like, okay, they seen I was leaving, they're trying, you know, they're trying to get my attention, and again he had to go, no, I have to let I have to let Rebel go, and and he had he was he was crying on the phone when he was telling me this. Um, it, anyway, yeah, messed up, dude. <laughs> so he he he's torn. He wants to go help because it's not far away, but he feels like it, uh, something is trying to to get him over there to get him, and, and he he said he couldn't not feel that way because that's just what he was feeling in the air. So he said, you know what, all right, I'm going to at least put a shot on one of these damn things. I'll just, I want to see it, and I'm going to shoot it for hurting Rebel 
and and maybe he'll drop Rebel. I can retrieve him. Something. One last ditch effort. He he couldn't just cut seven years of unconditional love from his dog and just ah, oh well, bye Rebel. He, he couldn't do it. He had to he had to fight for his dog. I I, I get it. So he turns around. And he goes in that direction and and he's he's on point. He's ready. You know where you where you at, motherfucker? I'm gonna you know I got something for your ass. Comes around this little stand of uh, willows leaning next to some pines behind it, right? So as he comes around the trail, all of a sudden there's Rebel. Rebel's on the ground, kind of doing a half crawl, whimpering, kind of uh, kind of woozy and out of it, kind of thing, like he'd just been through a ringer. And uh, he's like, "Rebel, Rebel!" And Dog instantly looks over at him with the very fearful look on his face, like, "Oh no!" Not that he didn't want to see him, but more like a recognition that, "Oh." Uh, he's in danger and I can't help him. At least that's how Don felt when he put eyes on him. Now, where Rebel was laying on the trail, there's there's a couple spruce right up next to the trail because it's it kind of narrows out right at that particular point. So you have some trees on your right, some trees on your left, a little well-worn trail, and, and Rebel's on just to the back side of these trees. So, you know, you got the gap and then Rebel's laying in the middle and everything else behind Rebel is kind of out of view because of the the brush. So he's on point. He's looking around behind him all over the place. Nothing, nothing. He shoots once in the air, chambers another one, and puts it on safety and starts going towards Rebel. Now, he said when he got about 10 feet from Rebel and was saying, it's okay, boy, it's okay, daddy's here, you know, trying to soothe him because the dog was whimpering really bad and struggling to move but couldn't. It, it appeared his back was broken, okay? Um... As he's closing that gap, all of a sudden, something snatches Rebel and pulls him from out of his view and whips Rebel against the tree on the opposite side of the trail, just basically right in front of Don. Um, d destroyed the dog. One quick burp, and, and, and Rebel was gone. Um, basically, mush. He said that that rebel hit with such force that he felt the impact, like he felt the man. So immediately he's he's pissed. He's crying, but he's pissed. So he starts just randomly. He's he turns in a circle and just bam, 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 and he's just shooting into the trees. Right? He's letting them know, you know, fuck it, you know, it's this is it, and. He realizes he uh, he's out of ammo, and he's taken from his shirt pocket, and he's yelling and cussing as he's walking back towards down the trail. And at this point, he's resigned himself. Okay, well you can do me like Rebel if you want. That's fine. But you you know I got something for you first. He makes it down the trail with without instant, and and he's he's yelling, he's cussing him out, calling him every kind of bitch in the book. You know. Gets over to the cabin as he comes around the front of the cabin. He comes up the stairs and he noticed the door was open. And, and something felt very off about that. So he backed down, he backed down the, the porch and is looking around for any sign, any sign. And so he goes, well, now grant you inside the cabin at this point, it's, it's all shadowy. Um, there's no lights on in the place. All he had was little lanterns and stuff. There was no electricity. He had a small generator for emergencies rarely used the thing, right? And the rest of it was cooking on propane cans and all that kind of thing. So he said, you know what, okay, maybe it, maybe there is one in there, I hope so. Goes up the steps, kicks the door, and he's ready. And, and it's it's empty, it's dead quiet. He gets in, he shuts the door, does his little latch thing, and it, it's not dark outside yet. It, it, it's not. It's still it's still on into a little little later in the day to where the sun's going to be going down real soon. And he's battling within himself. He doesn't quite know what he wants to do about the situation. He, and he's crying. Uh, he, he was he was crying pretty heavy. We had to do this in a couple incremental phone calls because he got so emotional about it. He couldn't continue in that moment, and I wasn't going to push him. And uh, I hope I'm giving this story credit, Don. Um, so he, he's breaking down. He, he's over it. He, he's really mourning the loss of Rebel because it had been his companion for seven years, man. Unconditional love. Man, I got dogs and I, ah, uh, jeez. 
so he's coming to grips with that and he's he he felt so alone in that moment uh, he felt like the only person in the world and and I could understand that I, I really could so af after he pulls himself together all of a sudden his appetite's real heavy because he, he had basically hasn't eaten in like two three days now at this point because of how things had transpired uh, he didn't know exactly how many days because of how he fell asleep and when he woke up it was daylight he didn't keep calendars or clocks so it could he could have actually slept a whole day and not known it his words not mine so he was giving me reference on you know how things were going he decides you know what I still got daylight I can make it to the truck I'll go visit my I'll go go down you know the road you know maybe I'll go down to the the, the lodge by Trapper Creek and, and get a room for the night and just kind of think about what the hell I'm gonna do about this whole situation because he's at a loss these things just killed his dog um, they're stalking him in essence uh, I mean you know using the dog to try to lure him out his love for the dog kind of has a similarity to the one mimicking a baby to lure him out cunning shit man so he, he's resolute about his decision to leave and he realizes by the time he makes that trail to where his truck is, um, sometimes he, he had to jump it because it had a bad battery and where he was, it wasn't easy just to drive into the Walmart in Wasilla and get another one. He had to plan his, his drives and, and what have you, right? But he had one of those little jump boxes um, one of his kids gave him for Christmas the year before. So every time he would go in near town or start his generator, he would plug this thing in. So when he did have to go in his truck, he had the little jumper to to get it started and so he was contemplating these things he gathers that up he puts it in a pack um, grabs a couple of important paperwork document his his wallet you know and gets this stuff ready and as he's doing that um, he gets this overwhelming rush of just anger just this hatred anger towards w the situation transpiring around him um, there, there had been no activity since he left the woods but he, he was feeling like he was being watched in these moments. And so with that feeling of being watched, he was like, mm, it's getting close. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll calm down. Uh, I'll eat something else and I'll, I'll get some sleep. First light, when it's nice and bright, I'll get out of here. So he decides to do that. He didn't want to be quasi in the dark trying to work the jumpers and, and, and get the thing started with potentially these things around in the darkness. He wanted to be able to have better field of view before dealing with this shit, you know? And rightfully so. I mean, God, fuck that, man. Good God. So, he continues with his, his day in the evening. He eats. He, he's really tired. He's emotionally spent. Uh, he said he cried till he was out of tears. His, his tear ducts uh, or his tear ducts were swollen and itchy. It was like he was having a major allergy attack from and, and he was really thirsty because he was dehydrating crying. So he's, he's filling up on water and snacking and in between his fits of sobbing over the sorrow of his lost dog. Um, he, he didn't retrieve rubble rebel was mush and he left for his safety he he did he couldn't safely re retrieve rebel's body okay um so he's contemplating that you know what am i gonna do i can't i'm not gonna stay here anymore this place is now tainted um they killed my dog they're after it, it, i feel like they're after me and so he, he's resolved himself that he's no longer gonna gonna stay there um his his kids, his grown children, live in Aurora, Illinois, and they had been asking him a couple of years. You know, when are you gonna move down? You know, we we got the mother-in-law place, or whatever. But anyway, so uh, all these life decisions are going through his mind in, in in these moments out in the woods. He ends up drifting off to sleep. Now, as he's coming to from waking up, it, he got up before sunrise there was light on the horizon so he knew morning was coming soon and uh the reason he knew that at one point he took off the coverings from the windows he wanted them to be fucking looking in he, he sat to where out of view of the windows in his corner back of his bed waiting 
for something to look in a freaking window because he's going to shoot it in the face. His words, not mine. He said he'd had it. One of them was going to get some gunpowder burns all over their nose. It is his words. So he has that. He, when he wakes up, there's there's no, no movement around the windows or anything, but he knows within an hour or two, he's going to have to, to get up to that truck and, and just go and deal with it later after he's had time to recoup and, and figure shit out. So he gets up, he gets his stuff on, um, double checks his ammo, double checks all his necessities, double checks the thing, it's fully charged for the jumping thing. And as he's contemplating it, he's standing there in a surreal moment of realization that what he's worked for for 10 years and loves is now dead to him. His love for his cabin, his love for living alone in the woods, dead to him. He couldn't even... The, it didn't break him, but it broke his spirit for wanting to be in the wild. It, it, he was done with it. And and the sight of his cabin, he said, made him physically sick in that moment when he was looking around at everything he worked hard and loved to now it means nothing to him because of these things. I, I mean, I just... If you guys could have heard him telling it, Jesus, Jesus, man. So it gets lighter, and and he's ready to go. He's made up his mind. He takes a quick peek out the windows, no activity, but there's no sound either. It's dead quiet like it's been for a few days now, so he feels these things are still nearby somewhere watching him. And that's, you know, and rightfully so. I mean, he doesn't know. No one does, you know? So <clears throat> he's done. He goes down down the stairs at the front porch. He kind of checks his perimeter, try to check things out, make sure he's good, and then continues on a trail. And he said, I kept my eyes forward, my ears open, and I was moving at a quick clip as fast as I could move. Um, he had, had a knee replacement uh, a few years before that and um, and quite fully back to right, but it was better than it was before the surgery. But he had a little bit of a hard time when he first was warming up, you know, getting moving for the day, it, it was he was a bit stiff, is what it boils down to. And so, working out that stiffness as he's walking, he's lifting his right leg a little higher to get a stretch because he felt a cramp coming on and didn't want that. As as he's getting about where he can almost see his truck, so he's covered almost a quarter mile. So he said on the trail it cuts around and then cuts back to the road. And he was roughly not quite 100 yards before he would be able to see his truck. As he gets to that point, something from the brush he couldn't quite make out because it was a little bit at a distance, but it was dark, very dark. It was low to the ground, but very big. It ran fast from his right to left, about 75 yards away at, at a clip away from him, quartering away from him. So it was like, okay, whatever that was, I'm assuming a black bear, it's gone. Okay, but he's, you know, he, he's got his forty five seventy. he ain't, you know, he ain't gonna mess around with it. So, he continues on down the trail. As he comes around the corner of the trail, he sees one of these things pushing on his truck, kind of like gauging it, testing it, pushing on the bed of it, right? So, immediately, he just lifts the gun up and just shoots it right in the back. Boom! The thing crumples backwards a little bit, hopped up, and ran off into the trees. Meanwhile, he's racking in another shot. Boom, he's just putting shots behind it. He wasn't really aiming. He was just, you know, take that. Fucking take that, you know, for Rebel. So he gets over there, and he's looking at his truck, and it's not damaged. There's a little bit of a dent in the in the side, you know, the back quarter panel of the truck by the bed where this thing was just pushing on it, you know, kind of feeling it out. So he goes over. He tries to jump in to start it, and, and the battery was just a little too dead. It just did the old two turns around, around click 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 he's like shit so he pops the hood he gets out he hooks up the jumper thing to it and he's doing all this trying to keep the rifle you know held while he's putting on the things he it he was in the, he was in a fit of terror <coughs> controlled terror he knew he had to get it jumped to get the fuck out of dodge <coughs> he's gets it hooked up goes back to the front of the car and gets in the driver's seat and lays the rifle pulls a 44 mag out sets it on his lap because the rifle is too cumbersome to wield inside there and boom truck starts 
holsters a 44 as he stands out, walks around his door, and as he comes around to the front of the truck, where he sh it should have been in view when he was sitting in the truck, all of a sudden now, there's one standing just right by the trees. Uh, he said it was approximately 20, 25 feet away, tops. That's not very far. So as he's coming around to disconnect the little jumper box from his battery, he you know he he sees what he's he realizes what he's looking at, and immediately draws and just starts firing the 44 at this thing as it runs off into the trees. Doesn't know if he hit it, but he he was over it. He was gonna you know get him for rebel. Gets gets this thing, shuts the hood, looking around, no other movement. Hops in his truck and gets out of dodge. Um, he, he lived there a, a decade not an issue not even a freaking bear in his yard and then something like this happens and and there's yeah anyway um, anyone who's had an experience in Alaska uh, that would like to share maybe, maybe you had an experience that wasn't so aggressive maybe yeah, it was curiosity or whatever I haven't heard any yet but uh, anyone who's had an encounter, feel free to share Alaskan Harry Man Project at gmail.com or nocomp907 at gmail.com. Uh, you'll remain anonymous. Uh, typically, when I get an email, uh, email back, request a phone number because I, I want to, if I can, talk to the person um, to really gauge the level of uh, impact. Uh, it gives me a better idea of the overall what happens and, and if not that's cool too I, I can just read the experience it's not a big deal um, but feel free to share uh, thanks for all the new subscribers stopping in um, I'm not here to prove anything well, let me clarify that I'm not gonna sit here tomorrow and say here's my evidence here's this this and this I'm beyond that I, I know of their existence there's too many people I know that were with me plus their you know people they know that had their own experiences there's there's no debate for me there there's there's no amount of evidence they could tell me that it, they're not out there i know for a fact they are so i'm not here to prove anything hopefully get some good evidentiary footage on my documentary but that's not the the purpose of this channel the purpose of this channel is to get alaskan experiences out there real real experiences and, and not just what you may see with an out-of-state TV show coming up, like Discovery and all that, where they just make a mockery of, like, Portlock and stuff. They could have done that so much better with way more respect for the culture. Elders don't come down to the beach and say, watch out for not to knock. They don't do that shit. That's all production. They will invite you to their house, feed you, and tell you you're dumb. You know, they're not going to sit there and chase you down. You're, they're your elder. They just summon you and you go and listen to how dumb you are. So, anyway, I digress. Thanks to all the new uh, subscribers. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy, and we will catch you on the next one.